Since 1978, the South Bank Show has covered both high and popular culture, bringing the two increasingly together. That's been part of the message. So that, this, so that the distinction disappears. Bring it to a mass audience whenever we could over 40 years and made them part of the same culture. No one would deny now that so-called popular music has as long a shelf life as, and as much intrinsic value as classical music. Nor in this context that television drama can hold its own with the best out there on the stage. I'm pleased that tonight marks the launch of our eighth season on the Sky Arts, following 32 seasons with ITV. Over the last eight years, we've made over 40 new South Bank Show films, 200 South Bank Show originals. Each season, we've had the South Bank Show uh, Arts Awards and we've done various scholarship films. This season, uh, we decided to profile some of the most powerful and celebrated British television writers working today, whose dramas have drawn record viewing fingers uh, and won awards for excellence and praise for their excellence across the globe. For over 40 years, we've, we've prioritised television drama on the South Bank Show. In our opening series on ITV, our first drama was not something on the RSJ, which... Uh, um, <laughs> RSC... <laughs> Sorry about that, RSJ. RSC, uh, but our first drama was a film with Dennis Potter about his television work. Since then, we've profiled many uh, celebrated television dramatists, including Alan Bennett, Linda LaPlante, Kay Miller, Andrew Davis, Paul Abbott, Abby Morgan, Russell T. Davis, Jimmy McGovern, Sally Wainwright, and many, many others. In fact, uh, I think it's time for a dedicated channel for British drama to show these writers again and again, as you could go into a a bookshop and pick up a paperback again and again because the work is so good. There's nothing patronising about the reason we started with television drama at the time. I'd been going to the theatre quite a bit and I discovered again and again and again that it wasn't as good as what I was seeing on television. It wasn't as well written. It wasn't as well directed. It wasn't as well acted. And it wasn't reaching the big audiences, but that's apart from the other things. And today is still the case. And television drama has always been at the centre of this country's cultural conversation for over half a century, and never more so, or rarely more so, I think, than now. And that's to do with the quality of the writing. In this series of new films, we feature three distinct authorial voices and one highly original writing partnership. But I'm delighted to welcome to the stage the creator and showrunner of Line of Duty and Bodyguard and much else, Jed Mercuria. And the writers and stars of the League of Gentlemen, Psychoville, and Inside Number Nine, Steve Pemberton and Reese Shearsmith. <laughs> and the creator and writer of Call the Midwife, who also adapted Cranford and Little Women, Heidi Thomas. Let me start with you. In the uh, interview, you recently said, uh, no, you said at the award ceremony, people need stories. Can you develop that? I think people do need stories. I think since society first became society, it's been about people sitting around together, listening to the person who had something to say or to sing. And I think for me, in a world where people need stories, they need them for distraction, they need them for inspiration, and sometimes they just need them to pass an hour that would otherwise be painful to them. And I think that's as valuable as anything. And then if, as a writer, in a world where people need stories, you can find stories that need telling. There's a sort of symbiosis, I think, that everybody benefits from. Jen. Um, well, I, I don't know whether people need stories, but there's something about the experience that, that clearly creates this kind of relationship where people keep coming back to stories. Um, I guess because it's, it's a form of information exchange and we're hungry for information. Um, and, I, and, and I guess that if you look at it, most of the stuff that drives our appetites is there because it's evolved. It's just the best explanation for any human characteristics that it's gone through some evolutionary process. So the ability to 
process information and draw conclusions and, and look at scenarios being acted out and develop strategies is something that clearly we're, we're hungry for, that we want to see examples of how not to get eaten by a bear, I guess. <laughs> there, isn't any, there isn't any better way of passing information, is there really? Because stories are in everything, in every area, not just what you do, a dramatist, but they're in science or in everything you can think of. This is the story. This is what happens. From, you go from A to B to Z. That's the story. Well, I would say the best way of passing information is through mathematics, but yeah, we'll go, we'll go with, <laughs> tonight we'll go with yours, Melvin. <laughs> so there's no stories in mathematics. I'm, gonna argue, I'm not going to argue on that one. Uh, uh, Steve, what about you? Yeah, I mean, you know, narrative is, is, is everywhere, as, as, as Jeff just said. And, you know, you watch a, a football match and that has an incredible narrative to it. You know, the, the, the Women's World Cup uh, at the moment or, 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 the, or the, you know, the, the Tory party leadership conference has got an amazing narrative. <laughs> we want to know what happens next. Or not. <laughs> or, yeah, or, not. Or, or, or wish we could actually change the story. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think it's... You, you will find narrative in everything, and, and as Heidi said, that what we try to tap into is just serving that up to an audience who might be curious to see what happens next and see if we can entertain them and inform them along the way. Rhys? Yeah, everything they all said. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it gets harder, doesn't it, for people like us who try to create stories because everyone is so sophisticated, and the tricks that you find yourself employing are, are apparent to people now. And I think and everyone's attention spans are so short as well you've got to be very pithy in, in hooking people into your into your story you know you get sent a tech a, a youtube clip that's 30 seconds long i can't remember with that's too too long <laughs> delete it and so you know you've got to really hook people in and i think that's hard and especially with writing the way we try to write which is to surprise and write the kind of things that we used to enjoy watching ourselves where you you can't not half watch it you've got to sort of properly engage in it is it's exciting, and uh, if you can do that to an audience and, and hook people in and take them away from their, their business of their day, that's a, it's a, that's a lovely thing. It's a, a service. Television is a fairly strict discipline, or, or put another way, a very strict discipline, especially if you're on ITB, you've got breaks and so on and so forth. Um, does, that, does that impose itself on you when you're writing? Do you think that that is a big factor, or you can fall into it naturally as three acts, four acts? Which one of you wants to start with? We'll start at that end this time, Chad. Um, well, I, I, I've written most of my stuff recently for the BBC where there is, there is no commercial break to, to worry about. Um, so I tend to write in, in fairly free form. I don't worry about the act structure. I know that there are sort of real act structure ideologues who don't actually write TV, but they do inflict their opinions <laughs> on people who do write TV endlessly. And it's... I think that you have to look at it probably in, with a, a little bit more sophistication than that. The, the imperative with commercial television is to create a hook before the ad break. But because so many people fast forward now, I don't know that it's as important as the executives think it is. And you miss still, it. Sorry. Sorry. You miss it. Yeah, you're going right. too fast. You miss the. the yeah. Well, actually, then you don't back. need to worry about your first 30 seconds back because yeah. people just they just <laughs> land 30 seconds in. Yeah. If, if, they're, if they're going at times times 12 or times 30, yeah. you just you, you see a car advert and you press you press play, <laughs> and then you think, oh, I'm right in the middle of the ad break. They've, <laughs> they've kind of like smuggled another Volvo advert in <laughs> midway through, so you just become inured to it. It's when you see kind of whoever's back on and a bit of police tape and then you think okay I'll start watching again. You're gonna say? No I just what I find is there's a lot of emphasis as Jed says with academics and people who teach screenwriting and often charge a lot of money for teaching screenwriting and they've never written for the screen and so they, they sell a prescription essentially. I have never found that to be of any assistance whatsoever and early on in my screenwriting career I, I would read Sid Field, etc. Mm. But I find, certainly for me, it's not about structure, it's about texture. You go by the feel, you think, does this feel as though it's dragging? Does this feel as though it's pulling you in or pushing you away? So it's about constant, it's almost like running, for me, it's like running a cloth through my hands and you're, you're feeling it, you're feeling your way. And I think, you know, I'd like to say one learns to trust one's instincts, but inevitably, the more experienced you get, the less you trust your instincts, because 
the more often you see it go wrong or right. And so it's also about constantly questioning <coughs> what you've accomplished so far within the body of an hour, which is about, for a first draft for me, that will be about 65 pages that I then cut down as I, as I get further on. But the rules don't, they don't help me. Well, I'm so. going to persist in this one more, not, not heavily, but lightly. Mm -hmm. If you're writing a, um, a stage play, I presume that they'll say, well, we don't want it to last more than three hours by the time you have an interval or something. Quite loose and novel mm -hmm. can go on forever, and sometimes even the short ones seems if they do, and so on. Uh, but the, the, the business of, that, that you're in, it's, it's you know, 22 minutes and out. Even with you, it's 58 minutes and out. That is, if it isn't a different sort of discipline, let's move on. But it does seem to me to say, this means that you have to do that, that and that in a way that you don't in other media. I'm not saying it's letter or more, it's just that's, that's the way it is. And I wondered what influence. It is changing though with, with the streaming um, services. I think we're all quite jealous. I mean, we don't write for Netflix, but the idea that you could have an episode one week, which is 69 minutes, and the following week, 49 minutes, depending on how you felt that story. Do you find that story. attractive? Um, I, I do find it attractive on the one hand, but equally, I like the form. Um, I, when we're doing Inside Number Nine, we know we've got to hit that 30-page mark, you know, mm. 31, 32, and I like that. I like having a structure to an episode. Mm. When we did something like The 12 Days of Christine, which, which had 12, you know, one scene for each of 12 months, yeah. it was really nice to be able to pass all these scenes up into 12 and to know roughly, how, you know, if you were in August and you were on page six, obviously that was not very good. Um, mm. So we kind of, you know, we use those things to give us structure mm. And I think putting a, a box around something makes you more creative somehow. I think also we, we would all recognise that the precise delivery time is hit in post-production. You know, you don't do a script and, and sort of like go, oh, that's 59 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's like you shoot the thing, you cut it together, and if it's 63, then you know you've got to get four minutes out if you're trying to hit 59. And sometimes that's easy. And then you're struggling to put stuff back in because you've, you've done a natural edit and it's, and it's 52 or something. Mm. So you then go through a process. And as long as you've got enough time, then as in enough, enough editing days, you can fine tune it. And you can, you can always tighten things up in a way which doesn't affect the, the way that you've told the story. It's, it's, it's little things like how long does it take someone to walk across a room? Can we go back to when you started... Uh, uh, and what you got from where you started from. Reese. did you grow up watching a lot of television, reading? What, what, what set you off wanting to write? Um, well, I think, it, curiously, it was... Um, it, like, we're doing them now, it's our play for today's, and the dramas of Alan Bennett and Victoria Wood, and comedy that, was, that had a, an edge to it and a bite to it, and, and plays that you wouldn't normally see. I knew there was something different about watching an Alan Bennett play on TV. It just felt, the language felt different. It felt richer somehow, and I don't know what that was about, but it appealed to me, because it was a voice that was around me in the north. And from, I was from Hull. And um, so I think it was that, um, the darkness of, of Alan Bennett, and then into when comedy was around, and I was watching The Two Ronnies and Victoria Wood, and that was the sort of stuff of my childhood. But it, again, with Victoria's stuff, that definitely resonated with it being sort of a northern voice. But a savagery to it as well that was hidden in the, in the, in between the sort of the, the resonated in the bits. sense that you said I'd like to write like that, or you just think yeah, a little bit. I mean, I never, I still don't really consider myself as a writer. I don't know why I'm sat doing sat here, but <laughs> I do feel like that definitely informed my taste, and I, I enjoyed watching that sort of thing. And I thought if that's you know when I th thought I could be an actor, that was the sort of stuff that we started writing and and had a collective love of it. That was what was weird about us. For us, the league. I did. Did you have a direct watching television background? I think I did. I was an early reader and I loved to read, but my mother had a wonderful <coughs> habit. And you really, younger people, you do have to cast your mind back to the days sort of pre video or anything. <laughs> there was this serendipity about television. Suddenly, my mother would say, Oh, there's a film on this afternoon, and we would drop everything and watch, watch National Velvet or something. But I remember once being fetched out of bed at about half eight, nine o'clock at night, my mum said, you have to come and watch this film. It's one of the best films ever made. And it was The Hunchback of Notre Dame with Charles Lawton. And I was seven or eight. And she made me watch the whole film. I'd never been up so late in my life. But I sobbed throughout saying, 
He does turn into a handsome prince, doesn't he? <laughs> Promise me he turns into a handsome prince. And it's relentless. There's no way he turns into a handsome prince. It's utterly harrowing, most unsuitable for a child. And, and I loved it. You know, it was, there was something for me in that about the power of performance to bring a story alive. I mean, this is black and white on a screen about this big. But it completely enervated me and I think it made me realise that stories do not always resolve the way you want and that doesn't make it any less powerful and I think that's always stayed with me. Curious you should mention that. I, I saw that when I was a kid at the Weakness Cinema and I, for nights I looked under my bed before I got into bed every night. Scared. <laughs> I've never been as scared from a film as, as Lawton yeah. playing Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yeah. It was terrifying. Jed? Yeah, I watched a lot of TV as a kid. I mean, I, it was... Um, I, I guess it, it was my own only real access to the arts. You know, I, I went to a very ordinary school, um, didn't really do drama or have much access to creative things. And, you know, I was, I was a sciencey kid anyway. So TV was my only exposure to storytelling, um, apart from, you know, maybe occasionally going to the cinema. And so... I, I kind of didn't really return to the influences until much later in my career. And I, I think that it was probably the American television that I had the, the, the best relationship with. I remember not being a great watcher of the BBC and thinking it was all a bit middle class and a bit... It was just... It was like watching a play, which is just people talking about the past. It's just... You know, God, have a car chase. You know, that's the sort of thing as a as a twelve year old boy I wanted to see, and the the Americans were giving us that. Um, so that's probably been the biggest influence. And you, Steve? Yeah, I, well, I watched TV avidly, um, especially in the summer holidays when when TV was yours. You know, as the kid, uh, in the evening it was the one remote control and on the side of Dad's chair, and you watch whatever what the family watched. But in the summer holidays, it was curtains closed and we'd have Laurel and Hardy on. You'd banana have split. Banana split. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, flashing blade. Um, uh, so I'm mum going, you've got to go and play outside and flinging the curtains <laughs> open saying, no, I just want to watch TV. And, um, and, and then, you know, the other side of that is late night horror movies on BBC Two, like you say, on a tiny TV mm. um, when we shouldn't have been allowed to watch them. But I think going back to your point about The Hunchback of Notre Dame, films which don't give you that neat ending, I think mm. stay with you much mm. longer. And I think there's a huge mm. lesson that I learned watching The Wicker Man and Don't Look Now as, as is probably about a you know, 12, 13-year-old boy, which both of which, you know, without giving spoilers away, have these horrific endings that you can't process as you're mm. watching them. Mm. And that stayed with me for the rest of my life. And something that ties a nice neat bow on the end, um, you know, is... is too easy to forget. There's this idea that goes around, let's see what you make of it, that write what you know. Have you found that that's... <coughs> excuse me, have you found that that's been any help? Well, I started writing very young and I didn't know much, so I think I would have got to a dead end quite quickly if, I need, <laughs> I, if I'd only written about what I know. But I think, perhaps instinctively, even now, I look for what I know within what I don't know. There's always a sort of navigating moment where one identifies with something. For example, when I was adapting Little Women, it was a book I thought I knew because I'd read it over and over again from childhood. And when I came back to it as a woman of 55 to adapt it for the screen, I had to navigate through it by looking for what I knew and what I remembered. And what I actually found, which was so much richer, was a very complex novel about love and grief and loss and growing up. So <coughs> that was, for me, the... But, at all times, I was looking for things that did feel familiar. So I think it, it's about finding that balance. I mean, I have led quite a tedious existence. If I wrote about what I know, it would, it would just be really boring. Because I've, <laughs> I've been a writer yeah, since I was what, 23. That, that's, that's what you've done, not what you know. What you know mm. includes what you've read and what you've mm. imagined and what other people have told you. So it's sort of that, isn't it? I think well? sometimes I've found out things I don't know. There was a scene, again, in Little Women, which in the novel is just one line, where it describes how Jo used to go to her father for consolation after the loss of her sister. And I lost a teenage brother when I was still in my teens. And... I was able to put words in their mouths that I that existed within me but had never found their expression before. So I suppose that was a case of me using something from my personal 
lexicon, if you will, to create dialogue and put something on the screen. Jed. Um, well, I, I had a, an unusual route into to writing for TV. I, I went to medical school and I practiced as a doctor and then I, I got involved as a, an advisor initially. Um, so I was very fortunate that the first thing I wrote was very much about um, my primary experience of working in, in the NHS, in hospital medicine, in the, the sort of early to mid-90s. So that, that absolutely informed my first um, series because it was, it was revisionist of the dramas that were on at that time, which, uh, which you know, they're still going, those juggernauts that will last forever. You know, Casualty and Holby will be on long after the world <laughs> is dust, you know, it's just like... And these other medical dramas that, that try and approach it differently just come and go, and they're just not, you know, these things are like cockroaches, you just can't kill them. <laughs> um, so I was kind of reacting against something that was already part of the, the TV orthodoxy, even the TV dogma. So I had an enormous advantage. That was cardiac arrest, but what made you want to do it in the first place? You're a doctor, you're also trained to be an RAF pilot, which you managed to do both at the same time. Anyway, never mind, it's, uh, it's you know, unimaginable as far as I'm concerned to do those two things. But what made you want to write it? It was actually a response to the, the advisor role, which was, was uh, asking uh, for doctors to, to come forward to, to volunteer to advise on uh, a medical drama that was in development. And as it turned out, I, I know that production companies rarely do this, it was just a big lie because they, they didn't have anything very significant in development. They were kind of scrabbling around a bit. And so I started giving them advice on how you might do something about the field that I knew, which was uh, hospital medicine from the viewpoint of the junior doctors. Um, and there just came a point where they felt that it would be better unfiltered, that rather than then talking to a writer who would then put the doctors on a pedestal and make the nurses lovely and all those things, that actually it might be simpler for them if I did it. And I then just became quite, quite convinced that I needed to get the message out. It felt like an opportunity. The message being? The message being that what was being portrayed on television was... was um, very much a, um, um, a sanitised version of what was going on in hospitals to the extent that it, its reference points seemed either to only have existed decades before or maybe to never have existed. And so what was happening was that medical dramas were just feeding off other medical dramas about how doctors behaved, how consultants behaved, how nurses behaved, and so forth. So it felt like that the, the it was a, um, an opportunity to put out there something that, that changed the, the conversation around the working conditions in the NHS. And it had that jarring effect when it came on. Yeah, it completely solved all the problems in the NHS. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, everything's fine now. <laughs> Would you have anything to say about that, Steve? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, recently I came to writing really via acting, you know, so um, for us, I think it was a, a question of how do we give ourselves the roles that no one else is, is, is giving us. Um, <laughs> And then That's gradually, <laughs> gradually <laughs> over time, um, I, I, I think the writer has, has stepped forth and, and hopefully improved. And, um, and now we, we, we don't think of it in that way. But um, yeah, we certainly the first things that we wrote were all about restart rooms, really bad theatre companies, uh, strange northern towns where <laughs> you couldn't wait to get out, but you couldn't somehow escape. Um, so all, all of those things were brought to bear. In, you know, they were our first impulses. And, and now we've ended up with, with Inside Number Nine, where we can kind of write about anything. You do have to be drawn, something has to draw you to the subject in the first place. And like you say, you find, even if it's something you don't know much about, you, you find your, your way into it via a character, via something you've read, via an, an, another piece of television you've seen or a movie you've seen. There's all, I think there's, there's your life experiences, which, you know, as a writer might be quite limited, yeah. and, and the, what, what you draw from other people's as well. Come back fire though, because I remember when we finally did the League of Gentlemen on, on TV, and we I was sat 
felt like vindication that I was filming our own television series and I was in a restart room doing the Pauline sketches where I'd, I'd experienced them in real life and I thought, I'm back on the fucking dole. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being back in, and it, so it was full circle and it was like a depressing week. <laughs> it was reliving it. But yeah, that was very much taken from real life. Yeah. The, uh, you've, you've, you've all written comedy. I mean, you, uh, is that, is that a, are you in a different place, different gear from that? What about you? Start with you again, Jared. Yeah, I, I, I tried to get a lot of humour into Cardiac Arrest, the first series I wrote, and inevitably a lot of it got cut out for the time reasons. Basically, the, the thing we were talking about, about cutting stuff down to, to fill the slot. So th th there was definitely a, a desire to have um, comedy counterpoint the, the darker elements of that, and also just the gallows humour felt like something that was was important as a way of challenging the very earnest way in which people talked on medical dramas you know that the 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 way medical dramas tend to work is that some someone comes into hospital with their medical problem and then what happens is remarkably they find someone who gives a shit about their personal problems <laughs> and then gives them a talking cure for the episode Whereas in real life, that just doesn't happen. You go, you go in with a personal problem, no one gives a toss. You know? So that earnestness was something that, that, that I wanted to challenge, and the way to challenge it was through humour. Yeah, and to challenge Comfort TV, you two, you, you, you're challenging it and doing the same thing there, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, we like to... You know, what, you've, what has been called Comfort TV? I can't remember which of you said it. Yeah, yes. Um, we, you know, I think we stumbled upon this f format which allows us to, to take some risks with, with how we present a half hour of, of television. So we've enjoyed doing that o over different episodes. Um, but, you know, h humour is something which any drama should have and drama is something that any comedy should have. That they really, you, you don't separate them in your mind. And sometimes when you're trying to come up with a joke, it's the most serious-minded thing and you construct it. In, in a, you know, you know, we're not sitting around killing ourselves laughing. I remember God the first, no. um, <laughs> <laughs> the first joke in the League of Gentlemen, which which is a guy reading a letter on a train, and it was taking us in, into the. Uh, we knew we need, we needed a, a hard joke to, to come in on to show people it was a comedy, and we just sit and pondered it and thought, right, when you're introducing, a, we we watch the opening few minutes of things like Twin Peaks and and uh, Northern Exposure and. Tales of the City, anything where a character comes into a world. And, and in a number of them, they use narration. So we had this character reading a letter, and then as you pull out, you see that it's the old lady sitting next to him on the train who's just sit reading his letter. <laughs> and, and it worked a treat, but it was constructed. It was done, you know, it was not just, oh, I've got a great gag, you know. And we've all got the, the mate down the pub who tells, who's the funniest guy around the table. I mean, you know, I have, and it's never me. Uh, <laughs> but th that, that person wouldn't necessarily know how to take what skill they have and create something with it. And I think that's what you learn over many years and months and hours of writing. There's a deep yearning for Comfort TV. I mean, Call the Midwife. Um, it was called um, Comfort TV. It's, it's, it's very difficult to watch a lot of the time. I mean, there, there's people in agony giving birth. There's people... We saw the tiny clip from with the thalidomide baby, uh, and Nonny goes, Do you, does, does it being thought of in that way uh, upset you? Or is there something about the public that's going to find that, if it possibly can, in whatever circumstance? Well, I think it goes back to what we were saying at the very beginning, which is, what are stories for? Do people escape into them? Do they feel inspired by them, consoled by them, whatever? And the funny thing is, I, I've never actually written comedy. And in fact, over recent years, I've got a reputation for making people cry. And the episodes of Call the Midwife are judged according to, you know, is it <coughs> tissues, is it toilet rolls, is it kitchen roll? How much, how much are people crying? And, but in a weird way, people are consoled by their own tears. And I think time and time again, when I get personal letters from people, it's often because the show has given them a form of catharsis. Perhaps they've wept over somebody dying in Call the Midwife when they didn't weep 20 years ago over the death of a friend. I mean, that's a very raw and reductive way of putting it. But I think people are comforted when they feel something, even if that feeling is sadness or empathy, a painful empathy for somebody who's you know, suffering in some way. But in terms of what the audiences will take, 
some of the, from the very beginning, some of the episodes of Call the Midwife were way ahead of what people had seen about childbirth on television. Mm. I mean, it was close up, literally close up. It was agony and it was mm. serious agony and you, you feared for the life of both the, the people concerned. And quite rightly, it was 1957 and gas and air hadn't been invented. You know, there, there was much to fear. But I think... One of the interesting things for me about Call the Midwife is when we were writing it, we presumed it was going to go out at nine o'clock. That was the slot we were prepping for. So in other words, post-watershed. And about 20 minutes in the first episode, there's a character who hops up on a bed and removes her unattractive drawers and says, I've had some shocking discharge. And <laughs> that, we thought that was fine at nine o'clock, but there was sort of a collective gasp because nobody had said discharge at eight o'clock, which was <laughs> where we were put on. And when we found out the show was actually going going to be on at eight o'clock on a Sunday night. Uh, Dame Pippa Harris and I wept in the office because we felt, A, the show had been underestimated in terms of what we were hoping to achieve in terms of candour, um, perhaps pushing the envelope a bit in terms of women's health particularly. But also, we thought if we did get a second series, we wouldn't be allowed to do the things we'd done in the first series. And what we have found over time is the audience can take an awful lot. They can take the word vagina, you know, and they can, and, um, you know, that we show placentas on a regular basis. We've got, you know, numerous placentas made of silicon. We show that, we show. We can't show a lot of blood, interestingly. And I remember once saying, but there was loads of blood on telly last week. And they said, ah, oh, but that's crime. <laughs> that's all right. And, um, you know, so there are physical rules, but I'm always guided by, I remember hearing an interview that Charlie Chaplin gave when, sort of in the late 1940s, so he was a man reflecting back on his career, and he said the most brilliant thing. He said, I have never written down to my audience. And I thought that was fantastic. You respect your audience, understand that they can take hard things, perhaps, you know, you know perhaps wrapped in an attractive wrapping. Though there are think times in Call the Midwife when I think some people may not want this, but if they... I say it's sort of a bit like a trifle. You can scoop the top layer off the fluff and the cream and just enjoy that if you want to. But underneath there is there are harsher truths. How or more fruit. Sorry. <laughs> uh, how much do you, uh, Jed, how much are you involved with your characters to the extent of saying, I won't let him or her go because the audience is, not because they're popular, I get him more audiences, but the audience is, I've, I've got somebody there that the audience are identifying with, they're very fond of, very interested in the development of, and is there ever a tension between it'd be good if they were killed off or it'd be better if they'd stay alive? <laughs> well, it's always got to be about what's, what's in the best interest of the series. Clearly, it's not in the best interest of a character to be dead. So the, the way I would approach it is look at what, what <coughs> new, new story you get from that. And if, and if the audience has got a real attachment to a character, it means they're then invested in whether there'll be justice for that character or if there's a mystery around it, they'll be invested in, in finding out what might have actually befallen them. Yeah. Can we just talk for a moment about adaptation? You've both done, ad you've both done adaptations. You'll, I want to comment on it, but you did D.H. Lawrence and you've done Cranford. Is that an entirely different operation? I think I use the same skills and the same approach, to, certainly to storytelling. Um, and mostly I've done adaptations that have not been obvious. They're either unfinished or, as with Cranford, it was an amalgam of three novellas. So I think it's also very interesting that nobody's first big job is an adaptation. It's something you come to much further down the line. And yet even from other writers you hear, oh, well, it's so easy for you. It's much easier when you know, somebody's done the story and written the dialogue. But to take a novel or a novella and convert it into a piece of screen drama, it's like taking you know, a 1930s dance dress and turning it into a trouser suit. It's a different genre. You have to dismantle it and reconstruct it. So, um, but in many ways, it's, it's about you know, how do we introduce these characters? How do we get into this world? What happens when we're in there? How do we pull away and get perspective on it? And that's the same whether you're creating original material or working with something written 150 years ago. Yeah, but the one difference is that you've got to work before you that you, that you would respect and say, I can't let... Do you feel, I can't let this work down? Does that enter? Oh, to? I mean, completely. You can't... There's two, you know, big terrors in adaptation. One is you can't let the book down and the other is you can't let the readership down because people expect certain things of an adaptation of a book that they know well whether it's Lawrence or something like Little Women I don't know how I had the nerve you know it's one of those things where you think I love this book so much I couldn't resist the offer to adapt Little Women but 
I knew there were 10 million women worldwide who would bay for my blood if I got it wrong. And, and that took a lot of the pleasure away. I mean, it really, it really did. Um, but it is about trying to identify that which is sacred within the book and burnishing and nurturing that to the best of your advantage, knowing that ultimately every adaptation is judged not by what you put in, but what you leave out. What about Lady Chudley? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's going back and, and probably I, I was susceptible more to the commissioning preferences then. You know, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm in a fortunate position now where I, I don't have to do adaptations. So you had to do it because it was a job that came your way at the time it was when just, you wanted yeah, to Yeah, it was an opportunity yeah. and, and I was sort of, you know, I'm a, <coughs> I'm a full-time working writer and the... The time it came, we had no idea of the future of Line of Duty. I think we'd, we'd shot series two, but we had no idea what was going to happen next. Um, and, you know, if series two hadn't been successful, then the series would be over. So it was, it, it, it was an opportunity to do something where, fundamentally, it was green lit. You know, the, cha the channel had decided that they wanted to include it in a series of adaptations of early 20th century novels. And if, and if I didn't do it, they'd, they'd offer it to, to some other creator of dodgy thrillers or whoever, whoever else it would be that was, was in line. So I thought, well, I read this as a kid. It's basically the only major literary figure that I ever felt any affinity for because we'd done uh, Lawrence for English O-Level, which was the last English I'd done, and I grew up in a small mining town in the Midlands, and he wrote about working-class characters. So there were, there were a lot of affinities there that, that made me feel that it was, it was a good project to take on. But I, I, I completely agree with everything um, Heidi just said about the, the, the different um, interpretations of how... An adaptation is successful. Being critic, you, you you don't normally get criticised for another story you could have told for a piece of work you've done because nobody has any idea what what else you could have done. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if they've read the book, they'll have an opinion, and and obviously the critics think they've read the book, and so they'll have an opinion that just proves that they don't know anything, but they'll still put it out there. So it, it's. It's a bit of a... I, I do find it a bit of a poison chalice. Yeah. Do you feel that you're working... In, I mean, you, you take things from other film directors and you don't adapt, you adapt and change them. Is there any similarity to what uh, Heidi and Jed have been saying and what you two do, Rhys, Steve? Well, Steve did adapt The Map and Lucia. So that oh, was course, a, yeah. that But was in, a big... inside number nine and those... But number there. nine is, is a, a magpie's nest of, of, lo of all, as, all our... Uh, written work has been really the sketches of league were four young men that were just given a television series and suddenly were able to do that bit from the shining and do that bit from don't look now and we were just enjoying all our references laid bare and and in the hands of steve bendelak who directed it who got all those references it was a it was a joy to do but you look at it back at it now and it's quite a strange mix of things it looks like a you know, an artist's palette with the splodges of everything on it. And I think we've tried to hone and be more disciplined about how we take our um, inspiration. And, and, you know, tonally, n number nine is really great to write because we get to change it up every week so we can do a more psychological one that we can th that think is a bit more of a, of a pinter play and then we can do something that's very broad and slapsticky the next week. So Or we, a silent film. Or a sli silent film, yeah, and that, yeah. that was a... A great thing to do. It's funny talking about the the time slot that you get. That's a, an interesting thing because a lot of number nine is very, I think, not that dark at all. I mean, I've got a twisted sensibility, but <laughs> <laughs> my threshold is different to everyone else's. But sometimes I think this could be on at eight o'clock easily, and people would like it. But we've got we've been pegged at a certain time with the expectation of this darkness, and I think that sometimes goes against what we do, especially with it being deemed a comedy. I mean, none of them are very funny. <laughs> but sometimes I think we get um, a way with... We, we affect people more because they, it comes in the guise of a comedy, so you're geared up to watch ostensibly the, the slot that Mrs Brown's boys is in, and then you get something that makes you cry, and that's, it blindsides you a little bit because you're not prepared for it. Mm. And I think that's, that works in our favour sometimes. 
The, the business of you, you and uh, Heidi, and, and I'd like to <coughs> bring in the others, you, uh, you, you work uh, against, uh, inside and against institutions. Uh, what does that give you, Jen? Um, well, I think that there's still a lot of drama that represents institutions in the way that they want to be represented. You know, when we started doing Line of Duty, we sought the uh, cooperation of uh, the Metropolitan Police to be advisors on it. And we very quickly realized that that is, is PR-led. If you're, if you're t giving the version of the police that they, they want to propagate, they'll help out. I'm, I'm not saying that you know they should stop investigating crimes and help out TV shows, <laughs> but it, the, the fact that they do help out some TV shows and they very specifically wouldn't help us out it is, I think, it says a lot. And you know, I was also in writing about medicine. I tended to tell stories which were about the darker side of medicine, the way in which, say, negligence is covered up and. The, 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 all the political manoeuvring around and uh, those things. And actually, those things have remained prevalent in our institutions all through my writing career. That there may be a few things that come and go with fashion, but fundamentally, the institutions are, are there to, to promote their own well-being, not to do the job that they were originally founded to do. And that's something that I think a, a, a lot of drama doesn't really tackle, and, and, and obviously there are, there are lots of reasons for that. Do you find the same with the... And you're a great advocate of the NHS. I am an advocate of the NHS. What's interesting with Call the Midwife is it's a drama... Well, we've now covered eight or nine years of history. We're in series nine. And with every series, another year passes by. And when we started the drama, it was set in 1957, when the NHS was up and running in a, the most spectacular way. Um, but over the nine years that we've, you know, been in the East End, watching midwives at work, hospitals at work. There's huge change, um, even within people's expectations. You know, con every, at the beginning of every series, I say, what's the prescription situation? Because sometimes prescriptions were free, sometimes they're being charged for. It was a constant political hot potato. So every year I read Hansard and see what they were arguing about. But I think the thing about the NHS is, to my mind, it was part of the engine of social change and development in mid-century Britain. So often we see the NHS operating hand-in-hand hand with what we would now call mental health services. And there are different rules in play. There are different rules for the poor. There are different rules for women. There are different rules for the mentally challenged. And constantly, what I find is not... I'm not writing a drama that's set in an institution or is about institutionalised medicine, but it's what are the axes between medicine and society and how is our perception of ourselves as a society affected by medical change. Um, Steve and Rhys, when you created characters, do you stay with the character that you have created or do you change them or do you develop them between you? How does it work, the two of you working together on a character? We had a little bit in that snippet. That yeah, well, we, we often don't uh, decide in advance which character we're going to play. Uh, and I think in that way, what one, of, one of the earliest things we discovered is that if you write every character as if you are going to play them as mm. the actor, uh, then you will make each character interesting because no one wants to be stuck as an actor with a <laughs> duff kind of, you know, yes, Sarge uh, kind of character. Um, and, and I think that st stood us in good stead. Um, and we will look at, once we've finished, when we've got our six scripts, say, for Inside Number Nine, we, we'll want it to be um, a fair distribution of characters and you'll want to play different types of characters. Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of horse trading session where we kind of, you know, it's a bit like a card game. and go, OK, well, if I'm uh, Hector, <laughs> then you can be Edward. And um, <laughs> we'll, we'll share them out. And, and it, it seems to work. Yeah, I mean, we've to go back to that point of, of killing your... Characters, we'd very deliberately in League of Gentlemen killed off what we thought were our the catch because we got a bit annoyed that people thought it was catchphrasey and a bit easy. So we killed Tubbs and Edward with the local shop people in the beginning of series three, thinking it was a stupid idea, we shouldn't have never done it. <laughs> but we thought, so, yeah, we, we brought them we, back, we brought them back <laughs> immediately. <laughs> so uh, it was fine, but so uh, yeah, we thought, you know, we don't want to be. Uh, the, uh, th any level that, uh, that we've, we're treading water or we're doing the same thing over and over, so we thought we'll get rid of our most popular characters. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stupid idea. <laughs> Don't do it. 
Well, we've talked for this length of time. We said we'd talk. I'll come back to them at, to the panelists at the very end. But if you have any, come put the lights on and have questions. There's a microphone around if anybody wants to ask a question. I don't know who's got the microphone. Yes, somebody at the back. Here we are. Well, this. If you see a hand, would you pop a microphone into it, please? That's the best way. So if you keep your hands up, that's right. Yes. Thank you. Do you want um, to stand up? So we can oh, all yeah, see. sure. Um, I just wanted to ask, what would your advice be to new writers trying to get into TV, specifically with regards to rejections? <laughs> please, thanks. Oh. Well, I, I found uh, that, you know, writing off letters as an actor, you get the rejections are more painful because it's literally they send by your CV with a staple through it. Um, as a writer, I found that when you did get a rejection, at least somebody would write something, you know, an opinion of, of, of what you'd done. And, um, and I think it, having that process, if you, if you do get someone who writes you a nice, a nice letter back or seems to understand at least what you were trying to do, maybe it wasn't right at that time, mm -hmm. it's finding the right people to work with, which is mm -hmm. essential, and the right mm -hmm. producers and executive producers. And, and, and they, are the, they are the doorway between mm. you and in your office and your blank pages mm. and this commission. And um, so I think if you're lucky enough to find uh, somebody in, in one of those positions, mm. and you, you keep working with them, don't you? I agree. And I remember after I started to make some headway in my own career, a writer who was sort of starting out said, but I just can't get the meetings with heads of drama. And in actual fact, I would say... For example, I executive produced Call Midwife with Pippa Harris, and we met on our first TV jobs, you know, in the days when people wore leggings in the office. I mean, this was about, <laughs> uh, I think it was about 1991, 1992. And we're sort of executive producing together now, but we started our relationship when she was so junior. She didn't have a desk. We used to sit on a chair in the corridor and, and meet. So I would say look for other people who are starting out to make those connections with, as Steve said. And the other thing that while well, I have the platform is a lot of new writers come to me and they say well I'm developing a series and I've written eight episodes <laughs> uh, but it's a 12 parter and I'm like stop <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants to read your eight episodes you write one really good spec script that you feel represents you well and the first thing I would say is I do also know new coming writers who a try go direct to producers and if you put some energy into trying to find an agent who can do that for you once you've done your first spec script and developed other ideas the agent will then work for you while you write a second thing and a third thing and start to practice with your own voice because I think having two or three irons in the fire when you start out also helps you cope with rejection because nobody ever had three projects rejected all on the same day, <laughs> all in the same week. So there will always be, you, you know, you, you need to sort of cast your net wide and stay very focused because everybody gets rejection when they start out. And, you know, the business needs new writers. It really needs new writers. And, okay. you know, just keep at it, really. Any, who's next? Um, so if you could go back in time and start your careers again, uh, would, is there anything you do differently or...? Uh, change anything about them Ooh. when thinking about writing and stuff? Yeah, I've missed the middle bit out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it goes back to the, the, the first question about coping with, with when things go wrong. You do learn from that and, and it's, uh, and, you know, I still get rejections now in terms of projects that I really believe in and people don't want to make them for whatever reason. And you've got to find the, the, the right relationships. And that's something that I, I probably learned after the event. You know, it's that, that classic thing that experiences the quality you have just after you needed it. And the, the fact is that there were a couple of projects that I got involved in after I'd become established where, in retrospect, I was working with the wrong people on the wrong things. And so it... it that ended up being a number of, of years before I, I corrected that. So it's, it's just an endorsement of the advice the others have given. I once went five years without a green light, and that wasn't at the beginning of my career. It was the middle passage. I got off to a flying start. I was, you know, looking back, I was quite lucky. But five years without a green light, whilst being constantly commissioned, is, is really hard, and most of us will encounter that at some point. Yeah, you end up taking an adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> Over there. 
Hi, you've, you've talked about time slots. Um, do you think the TV schedule is fixed? Or do you think the death of appointment to view is going to change TV writing? Who wants to take that on? Mm -hmm. Well, apparently appointment to view is dead, so you know, yeah. my, my stuff's knackered, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we all work for the BBC, um, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think people are curating their own viewing now in a completely different way. And I think what's going to change television with, you know, with people viewing when they want, what they want, when they want, is my fear is it's going to reduce the dialogue we have with each other. Ever since I was born in 1962 and in the 70s, TV was the glue that kept everyone together. But I had lunch with a friend yesterday I hadn't seen for a while. And the whole conversation was, have you seen? No, but have you seen? And we'd, he'd watch six things, I'd watch six things. And I'd, even though we have similar tastes, there was no dialogue because our recent experience of the medium was not overlapping in any way. And that's what I regret, rather than it being about the academics of which slot we aim for, if those slots are going to be superseded, is where is television going when there is so much out there and we're collating our, our viewing schedules at random? Yeah, I don't think that the the new um, way of consuming telly with the fact that you can you know, just decide what your night's menu will be is seemingly having any effect on the on the time frame of programmes. Like they all just seem the same. You, hmm. Your hour, your 45, your 22, your 30. That seems to... I've not heard any whisperings of that's going to change for anyone. Yeah, and pre versus post watershed. Yeah. I mean, it certainly hasn't affected the, the vast majority of commissioning that goes on. Yeah. Uh, right in front of you. Uh, yeah. oh, um, I'm an actress primarily, but I've just suddenly written two short films, uh, ten minutes from someone who's interested in them. And um, what interested me was that I was able to choose all the actors that I wanted and that made me feel really relaxed because I chose them. Do you, as writers, have any influence on the casting of your writing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me a pass. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We call anyone we don't want. <laughs> It's uh, one of the great joys, actually. It is, yeah. when, once you finish the slog of writing the scripts, is to is to have this, you know, this kind of spotlight. And uh, we have so many brilliant actors in in this, in this country. We're working our way through them in Inside Number <laughs> Nine, and um, it's it's a real joy. And I think to work with people who you've worked with before is a real joy as well. Um, so there's nothing, you know. We try not to go back on Inside Number Nine, but. Um, it, it, it's a, it, you know, when you know that everyone's going to be making the same program, it's so important mm -hmm. because that's something that can often happen uh, on, a, on, you know, big production, small production, whatever. If different actors are in different shows and, and different producers think they're making a different show to the director and things, the, the millions of pounds are spent on them, mm -hmm. don't have a centre and they can fall apart very easily. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it's great to, to be able to pick who you work with. I love finding new talent. Mm. because we have sort of a younger and an older generation certainly within Call the Midwife when we cast a new you know new midwife a couple of years ago I was looking at the tapes and somebody will shine out at you and they've perhaps not done anything on camera before and that's beautiful because then you start to look for the resonances between that actor and the character and especially if they're young and inexperienced sometimes you have to almost coax them along and make sure you're giving them the material that they can work with and I find that as thrilling <coughs> as you know someone like Miriam Margulies going on chat shows saying I want to be in Call the Midwife because um, I had always wanted Miriam Margulies to be in Call the Midwife so it was a brilliant marriage but you know she will be fantastic but when you bring somebody out almost out of drama school and you find out that they're fantastic it's so well inspiring it gives me a real shot in the arm really. What about working with a for, for a while anyway with a, with a, with a, set, with a cast a, a company like uh, Jed when you work with Line of Beauty, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's it's no accident that we have the same three leads. I mean, they're, they're really good actors, but also they get on really well with each other. We all get on very well. And, and, and if that hadn't happened, one of them would have been, you know, killed in some, <laughs> some complete, completely unexpected way that <laughs> propelled the story forward. Um, but... Um, 
Yeah, I, I, th I think that the, the, I'm, I'm in this very fortunate position to be a showrunner, so I am very involved in the cast and in the casting. And so um, it, it's about finding people who are the right fit for the world of the show. You know, people who are, who are credibly part of that. And a lot of that is then defined by the kind of actors you already have. You know, because we have three actors whose acting style is, it feels very authentic to being police officers, we can't necessarily bring someone in who appears like they're from a very different background or from a very different way of, um, of approaching the the scripts or the the performance requirements. So it ends up becoming kind of a, a, a synthesis between the existing cast um, and the script and, and the new people coming in. But it's rather like a rep company and directors who run theatres have rep companies and they use it to great advantage because they know the people, it's shorthand of talking, they can get more out of them the more they know them. Is that not a factor as well, the positive factor? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was just a specific example of, of kind of character continuity within yeah. one series. Obviously, if you then are working on something else and you start to look at, at cast, so in, say, um, Bodyguard, Richard Madden and Keely Hawes were both actors I'd worked with before. And once they, they were mentioned in connection with the, the series, then it, it was just helpful to have had that experience. You know, you, you, you know how hard it is to, to film um, television drama. You, you need people who aren't nuts and aren't <laughs> lazy. And, 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 you know, you just don't know sometimes. So it's, if you have worked with someone and they've, they've passed that particular test, then it, it's helpful. So the nuts and lazy test is early on, is it? Yeah, apparently it doesn't apply to being leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> I think the other, the other thing, though, with, with the rep company setup is we don't, as the writers, don't always have control over whether people stay or not. You know, for me, Call the Midwife has run for nine years and it's been an exercise in noble forbearance. <laughs> when young ladies come on the show and three years later they decide it's time to go to Hollywood. And every time it's like a stab through the heart. But I've now learned that that actually refreshes the brand and refreshes the company and you bring in new characters and new stories. But I now know the signs and I'm when I see the signs <laughs> coming out and I think, oh, Hollywood beckons. <laughs> I, 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 I start to think of how I will move them to one side. And it, it's like a, a bereavement, but I've also become quite sort of ruthless about it. And, and I just have to prepare for the worst, but it's not always the choice of the showrunner who stays, really. Annie, someone down here. Hi, uh, Rhys and Stephen, I was just wondering, you do such brilliant things with the format of the episodes of Inside Number Nine, where you kind of do things that you wouldn't expect looking at the format, like the silent episode, the live episode, there was episode, I think it's called Twice Removed, where the timeline is of what actually happens is kind of fractured to such great effect. I was wondering, when you look at those kind of episodes, do you, does the idea for this is a great thing that we could do come first, or is it... Does the format fit the story or the other way around, if that makes sense? Yeah, a, a bit of both. Um, we, uh, some, we wanted to do a, a... thought it would be good to do a silence episode, so that was the... Let's just see how far we can get. And then um, we enjoy now thinking about how to tell the stories and, 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 and grab the audience in a different way. You know, it's... People are very sophisticated, like I said earlier, and so it's to, to, to um, think about how you're actually consuming the story in a different way, and doing the live episode of, for the Halloween last year, it was fine, and we didn't really want to do it, because we thought, well, everyone does them now. You get the East, East Enders do it, Casualty do it, and we thought, but to do it and have a reason to do it, it suddenly came, caught fire in our imaginations when we thought, well, the thing, the reason why you watch those things is if it's going to go wrong. Is it going to go wrong? Am I going to see an, an actor do it, fluff his lines? That's the most that usually happens. 
And then we thought, well, let's take advantage of it abs completely breaking down and having the, the test card come up and <laughs> we're very sorry. And we were getting texts on the night that people were, oh, I'm so sorry you've worked so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was delightful because it worked absolutely as a prank type thing, but it just it, it, it propelled the idea of the whole episode, which was, was great. And that was an, an example of, of just enjoying the way of, of storytelling, you know, and the backward episode that we did where every 10 minutes went, and it went from the end to the beginning. That was a new way of revealing information in and in hopefully it was a complicated thing to do, but it was, it's just all about um, those new half hours. The number nines are really hard because each week it's a whole other world, a whole new world, and it's just to not be boring and not repeat ourselves. And it's an exercise in that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the format on its own that's interesting isn't a story and it doesn't drive the narrative. So, so it's interesting to, to come up with um, you know, a, a new device for telling a story, but you still need the story to tell because people are forever coming up to us and going, I've got a brilliant idea for you. Number nine bus. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You go, yeah. You can have that. <laughs> so you have to... So, yeah, then what? <laughs> you have to, uh, you know, make it work. But in answer to your question, um, yes, we, we off in, in those stories where, where there is a... Uh, an, an interesting narrative device. It usually is that first, and then how do we make it work to tell the best story? Hi, uh, Heidi, I've got a question about your writing process. I'm curious how much of it you'd be happy to reveal. Um, with such a long-running program, I'm kind of curious how you keep each episode, or give it a, a fresh um, concept or something like that, but also because the show seems so... The, the characters are very rich, very sort of... Uh, and identifiable in some way, and and whether they're leading it or whether you're coming up with a theme and then like beating the whole thing out or, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's a good question because at the beginning of every series, I think, oh, how did we do it last time? Because it seemed to work, and we're doing another one. I think what's enabled Call the Midwife to go on for such a long time because we're making series nine now is because we do a Christmas special year every, every year. Every series covers a year in time. So I always start with um, historic and medical research. And I, I like to have two stories for each episode. One will be what you could broadly call an A story, which might, it's usually a medical story, but it might not be a birth. Then there will be, and that can take us into a new world, for example, a character lives on a barge, or we might visit a culture we haven't seen before, like the Sikh culture. Then there'll be a B story where we try to use our standing sets for reasons of economy, because it's the BBC. So that has to sort of have like a smaller physical scope. And then I lace around that the series arcs or personal little stories for characters that might not span a whole series, but might pick up from episode to episode. So that's how you collate the raw material. And then I write, I write the lion's share of the episodes, but not every single one, because I love bringing guest writers on who maybe haven't written for this sort of slot before. But I'll give them maybe a five or six page treatment. They come back to me with a 14, 15 page treatment, and then I oversee the drafts. But I mention that because it's not dictatorial on my part. There's always a dialogue either between myself and the guest writer or between myself and that episode because we're character-driven and we don't have a format. And, you know, like a lot of BBC dramas, there's no compulsion to create a hook in the middle of the episode or a series beat. Things can spread to fit the space available. It might be more appropriate to have a slower pace, for example. And we've never had a format, but time and again, I find out there are rules I didn't know I'd written. Like, after a couple of series, we realise it's totally counterproductive. Once a lady, once you can see the baby's head, you can't cut away to any other strand in the episode. That baby has to be born because nobody wants to leave the delivery room unless it's to either see another baby being born or somebody dying. So, and it's only when I write an episode, I think this birth is not landing, and I'm like, oh, that's because I've gone off to the horticultural show, um, you know, just as the shoulders are being born. And so, I think that's it. There's no format, but there are rules and if you respond to the rules your drama creates, it's a, you know, it, will, it will retain its balance, I think. And the other thing, as I mentioned before, don't be afraid of change. Over a nine-year period, things will change. I mean, the look of the show is completely different. The colour palette is different. But I got, like, half an episode out of the invention of tights. And, <laughs> um, and sometimes little things like that, you think, oh, actually, this makes it a bit fun, because in the next episode, there's a baby with no limbs found dead on a draining board, so let's go with the tights. And the <laughs> next series, you know, in the next episode, sorry, we can really go into those darker places because when, 
you know, the, the series arc as a whole is not bludgeoning and without, rem you know, without remorse, really. At the front here. Hello, is there a microphone? Oh, there you are. <coughs> Steve, you mentioned earlier about the construction of a joke and how difficult it is when you're sitting there. I wanted to ask this quite a simple question, but how you all deal with writer's block when you're just sitting there and you can't think of anything. <laughs> well, I was going to ask them all we, afterwards. <laughs> we are very lucky in that we are a writing partnership. So what we do is we talk and talk and talk and talk. And we, you know, if, if we don't actually write anything or, or we don't to even turn a computer on, the day hasn't been wasted because we will have had discussions around it. Um, I, I have written things on my own and found it really hard to, to dig your, you know, dig your way out of that. Um, but, you know, the, the greatest tyranny is the blank page and that you just have to get something on the page. And I know that's the most basic piece of advice <laughs> and I have to tell it to myself every single time I sit down to write. But once you start, even if you don't know where it's going or, or you think it's not right or you know it's not feeling, just keep going, push through it is, is the best mm. way because it's in those revisions and corrections and seeing what you've got at the end um, that, that, that will spur you on to make it better. But you can't make a blank page better. It still remains no, a blank Somebody page. once said to me, because I have writer's block every day of my life, there's an hour where I sit there and think, I don't know how I'm going to start today. But somebody once said to me the most brilliant thing, and I would say it to any writer, which is first drafts don't have to be perfect. They just have to be written. Because <laughs> once you've got your first draft, however ragged and full of holes it is and however much you're embarrassed by it when you re-encounter it, you can then start to make it better if you haven't written it you can't make it any better. And I, I found that sometimes has been like a, the little life belt I cling to mm. on a bad day. Just write anything, Absolutely, really. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Jane? Yeah, it's a process. You know, I, I think that um, you... Well, you never, you never write the perfect script. You just don't. So you've, you've got to, to just keep exploring the story and even if you go back over your day's work and realize it hasn't worked and you've got to start again then you've learned something that you you didn't know so i think you just have to accept that it it's something that that doesn't work like a production line you you have to figure some things out and sometimes you spend more time figuring things out than actually writing them and other days you you figured a few things out, and so there's a, there's a, a, a lot of natural story that allows you to to, to flow through the, the 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 plot. We'll often write a script that's got the, the written word, and then blah 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 brackets a joke here, <laughs> <laughs> or we'll write something and think that's not right, but we'll go back, and we never do. <laughs> so these terrible scripts are our script. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just talk about scripts. I wondered how much I was going to say interference, but maybe I should say input you get from <laughs> your uppers. And maybe that's a really naive question. <laughs> Somebody works it's in factual. It's a factual, very naive question. <laughs> who, do you, do you listen to them? Do you react to it? You know, what, what stage of the script gets delivered on screen? Well, for, from our point of view, you know, we started as a team, as the League of Gentlemen, and we, we, we were a core already. So we weren't kind of in the market for somebody else to come and tell us uh, what our comedy was. And, and we were very, very lucky to get uh, collaborators, and collaborators are totally essential. Um, and we've managed to keep that going by and large. And like I said earlier, uh, about finding good producers and executive producers to work with. Um, I have had experiences of, of, of notes which, uh, on, on, other, on other things that haven't been necessarily my own, you know, creation. I've just written stuff, and it's it's very very hard to deal with that with that with that rejection. Essentially, it's it's bad enough having your idea rejected, or we're not going to make it. But then once you've written it, to have it rejected again and and the worst thing i think someone said to me was i think you're two or three drafts away thereby meaning <laughs> that the second and third draft i did you you were still going to send it back to me so you've pre-decided that this isn't any good and yeah it's it i don't know you guys maybe will know more about drama compared to comedy but i think it's Andy, what about you 
Well, I remember writing a kind of drama that was never made um, about the love life of the young Benjamin Disraeli, and it wasn't going well, um, <laughs> which wasn't for a want of, of subject matter. But the script editor sat me down, and I thought, well, this is a talking to meeting, and he said, now listen, Heidi, he said, I think what you need to do is write out all your characters in the form of a bar chart. And I still don't know what he meant. And, <laughs> and this, I'm going back about 18 years now. And, but if you knew... I think where, what his crime was wasn't in not liking my script, but it was not knowing me well enough to know that I failed CSE maths. And that was like <laughs> lower than GCSE maths. So a bar chart was going to be of no use to me. I, I work in a different way. And I think some, now I'm, I'm very lucky I don't, you know, I'm actually sort of training up script editors because script editing has become a sort of an entry level job <coughs> in our profession. I don't think that's a bad thing, but sometimes I'm, know a bit more than the script editor so nobody makes those sort of suggestions to me anymore but I think you I think when people try to give you advice you have to try not to perceive it as interference but as somebody genuinely trying to support you and sometimes it just helps you to acknowledge that what you've written is no good and that's the beginning of improvement hopefully. You can get good notes that do highlight something that you had a niggle about yourself and then and so you think yeah that, that's They've, you know, they've honed in on something that we weren't sure about, and so there must be something wrong with that thing. But it's when you don't trust the judgment of the person is is hard to navigate because you think, well, I've been working on this for so long, you've cursorily looked over it, and I don't believe I don't want to unpick it because of this thing you've said. Mm. So we don't. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Joe? Yeah, I, I think that. It's definitely part of your job and it's part of the process that people are going to give you feedback. And I think as a, as a writer, you've got to develop the, the ability to, to do that. You've got to be able to not, not only accept feedback, but seek it. Um, you, you won't develop as a writer unless you, you have an opportunity to hear how people are reading your scripts and what what their interpretation is of what you've written. Sometimes it's very illuminating when they say, I, I just don't get what's going on in this scene. And you ask them what, what is, what, what, what's confusing them, and sometimes it can just hone in on something that, that shows that your intention as a writer isn't coming through. But I also understand that the, the, the question is also about the terrible notes you sometimes get from executives and how you deal with that. And there is no way of dealing with it. All you can do is, is, is move on. You know, it's that they're never, they're never gonna say, oh, you know what, I've just had this incredible epiphany that I'm an idiot. <laughs> That's just, no executive's ever gonna do that. They're gonna stick by their notes through thick and thin. And, you know, some, sometimes you get people who just constantly give terrible notes because they don't get what the piece is or they want it to be something else. And it's not just at the script stage. Often the most damaging notes you get are once you've finished principal photography and you, you have that time where you show an assembly to a representative of the broadcaster who then says, well, can this happen here and can they not be in it and can they go over there and can we have some ADR where this is explained and yeah. blah. There's time for one or two more questions from the audience and a final <coughs> question up here. And, uh, we'll have Hi. Um, my question is, um, how do you react about season of or ending season being rewrite and reshoot because of, uh, of the pressure of thousands of thousands of people all over the internet that are not happy about a character's die <laughs> or something like that. And would you be able to do it, rewrite and reshoot um, seasons of episode? Well, after they've gone out. I think people suggested it for Game of Thrones, oh. didn't they? People were not content. And there was a social media backlash where it was suggested it should be rewritten and reshot. Yeah, I, think, I mean, if, if you tried to please, that I think I think the clue to whether that is valid is contained in the two words "social, social media." media. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, on, on on Twitter, people are telling you the Earth's flat. I mean, forget it. <laughs> I think if we started to buy into that. Um, You'd never finish, you know, because you would rewrite it and reshoot it, and then. Well, if they pay else... for it, if like these 
Muppets on Twitter are, pre are prepared to crowdfund. I would love to reshoot everything I've ever done. So if they, if they can crowdfund what the budget is, yeah, great, game on. <laughs> one more down here. There's, there's one at the back, one at the front. Um, a question for Jed, actually. What would your advice be for somebody who came from a completely different career and decide to get into writing? How did you do it? And what would your advice be for somebody else looking to do the same thing? And for Reese and Steve, maybe more so Reese, because I know Steve came from an acting theatre background. In terms of acting and writing your work, how, how, do you, how do you develop those acting skills for the work you're writing for yourselves? Yeah, sure. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose I was very fortunate that the first thing I was writing about was something that I, I knew a lot about. I was writing about the, the life of junior hospital doctors, and that happened, fortunately, to be the job I was doing at the time. So, therefore, not only did I have a lot of input in, into um, what the... <coughs> The, the texture and the authenticity of the world would be, but but also I was getting ideas every time I went to work. Um, I think it's different if you're you're going from a, 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 a job that has nothing to do with with what you're particularly writing. Then I, I don't think it, it particularly makes any difference. I think that you 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 have to to move forward in the way that any writer would. Do you think you can? hold down a job and write in the evenings and weekends? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I did. That's, 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 that's what, a good, you know, I think that's, halfway I mean, house. certainly a lot of, a lot of the, the newer writers I work with um, aren't at the stage where they, they can give up on, on doing other work hmm. to make ends meet. Um, I, I think it is a really important part of our industry that we, that, that we allow people to, to come through who are possibly socio-economically disadvantaged. I mean, it's very easy if you come from a rich family and they've got a, they bought you a flat in London and you can, you can just fiddle around with your craft for years on end and it doesn't make any difference. But I think the, the people coming, certainly from the background I came from, then the ability to earn money to sustain the career is absolutely crucial to whether you're going to be able to develop a career. And so if you do have another way of earning money so that you can write in your spare time. I mean, I was a junior hospital doctor. I was working long shifts, but I could still carve out an hour here and there or a couple of hours or, you know, if I was off at a weekend, I could spend six or seven hours writing. Don't clap. Don't encourage me. Don't encourage the class warrior in me. You do not, you do not know how far I will go. Yeah, I think the, uh, a lot of us start by uh, having a job to keep us going and writing because we really want to do it. And uh, mm. the two can run alongside each other for a long time. And all you do is pile into it and hope you get to the end of the job and the end of the, in my case, novel. But, it was common in my time. Most yeah, people aren't writing it. novels at a job as well. I mean, it was common for a lot of people for a long time, and then yeah. become slightly addicted. Anyway, can if, there, if there's a very urgent question, great. Otherwise, I'd like to ask one last question, and maybe they won't. No, you're a very urgent. Reese didn't answer his question about how to. Oh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Can you say the question again? I've forgotten it. Thank you very much. Any training in acting, but yet you also want to be a part. Um, of your work? Well, we trained together, so we are, we are, we, we did both train doing drama and, and did it at, um, at college, so we were. It was a sort of halfway house because it was a degree course, it wasn't quite um, drama the school. RADA. But um, <laughs> so we, we thought we were um, trying to be actors, so we did do three years. We had to write essays at the end and you got a degree. But uh, as Steve's always said, it's like having a degree and washing up. Having <laughs> but um, so I thought I think you just you've got to I remember the crossroads of, of, of school thinking I was either going to do something with my art because I can draw a bit or try acting and, I, and I, I just remember thinking I might regret it if I never this is the point where 
You know, the life has got these forks in the road and you decide to go down one or the other. And I remember thinking, I'll, I'll try and do... And I was hedging my bets because it was a degree course, but I just, that was where I pursued the acting rather than the art. And um, it only worked out really when we started doing our own thing. I came to London and tried to be an actor and was in London's Burning and TIE and not very good things. And you, you're one of many people and it was really hard as an actor. And then when we had our thing, which came about by accident, really, did you want to do these sketches on the fringe? And we'd been writing a bit. We pursued that, and then that became everything. It became 10 years of the League of Gentlemen. So we were sort of... our Then our work preceded us, and we were thought of as actors with that in mind, rather than just who is this person coming in, you know, this other person, which, you know, we, when we had our thing, we mined it, and then we were... We were notable because we, they'd, they'd seen the work already. Can I just ask you finally, the, all the new stuff that's coming, the Netflix and the Amazon and the Apple and all, is that going to affect you as writers? Does it give you more opportunities or do you rather bulk at it? More opportunities for rejection, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. We, we, we haven't gone down that, that road, I suppose. That there but are... It's a road that's coming. I just wanted... Uh, you're, you're very successful dramatists and you commanding and doing great work. Is this going to change the way you offer your work? Is it going to change the way you set about, well, I can do 16 episodes now, and is it going to have any big effect on you, or is it just going to become part of the landscape, and there you go, and nothing much has changed as far as you individually are concerned? Well, I think that one of the things that it has changed is the way in which television is consumed. I mean, I, I remember years ago where executives would... would sincerely advise you not to make things too complicated, not to have too much serial story because the audience wouldn't remember what had happened last week and had no opportunity to catch up. Um, whereas now the, the, the streaming services have driven the, the, the mass consumption of this kind of technology. And by streaming services, I would also include BBC iPlayer, which was, was in the vanguard. Um, but what it does mean is that people now do catch up. They do jump into series once two or three episodes have gone out. If they watch an episode and they're really curious about what went before, they'll go back and watch not only previous episodes but previous seasons. And that has enabled writers to, to push the boundaries <coughs> of complexity. I think it's also... Um, I'm writing or storyline in my 69th episode of Call the Midwife at the moment. And what you realise with the box set generation is you can never repeat yourself. You can't say, oh, we did that sort of case in series two because somebody might be watching series two this week and people binge watch and, you know, they might be watching series two and series eight within weeks of each other. But I think the other thing is it is changing the way television is commissioned. Amazon and Netflix, for example, they don't develop. And we're all used, I think, to the BBC culture where you have an idea and even at quite an early stage in your career you can be paid to write a pilot, you can even get paid for a treatment. Um, there are literally hundreds of scripts in development at the BBC at any given time, but Amazon, Hulu, Apple, etc., they want projects. They won't they don't sort of indulge you over or, or keep you prisoner for two years. They want to see a first episode and then they will green light it. And I think we're all going to have to be quite nimble to deal with that. And I do worry that it could mean, I don't know, on the one hand you could say it means there's a great desire for content and more projects will be made and, you know, we need more writers. On the other hand, without the development process, will nascent and emergent writers perhaps get the support that our generation got when you're sort of paddling in the shallows and maybe stuff doesn't get made and it's frustrating but you're learning and earning at the same time. And I think with the streaming channels, it's all a bit more all or nothing and that could long term have a detrimental effect on, on the writing experience. Fine but I, I don't know, sure. it's new, yeah. There's a funny gag in... Um... Family guy, it cuts to an office and a woman answers the phone ringing. She goes, Hello, Netflix, you're green lit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good ending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>